We finish our last uh, meeting talking about the Bernoulli effect, and that's the uh, slide which uh, is intended to refresh your memory of what was the Bernoulli effect. It just says that the, if you look at the volume of a fluid, which is ideal fluid, then the sum of the pressure and the kinetic energy and the gravitational energy per unit mass of that fluid is constant along the motion. Uh, that, of course, is uh, actually true for ideal liquids. And the outcome of it is that if there is a narrowing of the tube or a passage over which the fluid is moving, then the velocity there increases. And uh, 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 therefore, the pressure must decrease because the gravitation energy of the volume of a fluid in both places is the same. And I would like now to show you a little bit of application of a Bernoulli effect in that formulation. And this is the uh, application which deals with the pressure difference in our blood system when we are standing and we are on the f and we are lying on a bed or on a couch uh, when we are in a horizontal position then all parts of our body basically are on the same the gravitation field we have the same gravity potential in each places and i labeled three places here unfortunately i took that drawing from some Polish book. So you have to replace the letter M uh, at the head for B for a brain and S for a heart and N for a feet. So the notation will be uh, in my calculations uh, already in English. So when we are lying flat, then of course the pressure and the blood is not moving basically in our body. The velocity with which the blood is circulating in our body is really very small. So the kinetic energy is relatively small. And therefore, if I use the Bernoulli equation, which shows up on the screen, then I can forget about the contribution of the kinetic energy, that is this part, which has the square of velocity, and what counts is a pressure, so sum of a pressure plus the gravity, pot, uh, plus the gravity potential. That gravity is the same, term term is the same in all these three points. Therefore, the pressure is whole constant. But when we are standing, there is obviously a difference of between the gravity force acting on our head, on our feet. And again, the heights are, you should relabel the heights. Letter M is for a brain, and letter S is for the heart. And therefore, there is a difference of this. And in the top of the drawing, you see the measured values. They are measured with whatever technique has been used. And as we see, there is a considerable difference in the measurable pressure. So let's see what, what comes out from the application of a Bernoulli equation. If I, um, if I ne neglect the kinetic energy contribution, then there is obvious relation between the pressure on, of the, in the art, blood artery in my feet, P sub F, and the pressure in my heart, P sub H, and the difference is the height, di height difference between the, my heart and my feet times the density of blood times the gravity acceleration. And um, uh, the same, of course, applies to a uh, relation between the pressure in, my, in the art blood artery on my feet and in my brain. 
and that is this difference. So it is a very simple calculation that, for example, the pressure difference between my feet and my head, my high, and my heart, is equal just the density times gravity acceleration times the, the uh, a height at which my heart is above the ground. And if we assume a common values for it, then out of the calculation comes out basically the same number as it has been on, the, on, uh, on, the, on that particular plate, which is on the top of the page. And uh, this is in Pascal. And as you remember, in medicine, people use the other units, which is Tor. So if you convert it, it is, the difference is, uh, is about the hundred of the Tors. All right. So that was the uh, very simple application of a Bernoulli equation. But a different application, which I would like you to show, which is actually basically the same, is the, what happens when you are sitting in the accelerating upwards plane or a missile or a rocket. And uh, then the, if we start with the acceleration, which I labeled as A, and this is this big red arrow, then the, the Bernoulli equation tells me that I have simply to add the acceleration of the missile or a plane to the gravitation, to the, to the, to the uh, gravity acceleration G, and that is the difference between the blood pressure in my brain and my heart uh, in the accelerating object. So that is the drawing uh, or the photograph which shows you the experiment. The experiment was, uh, oh, I'm sorry. The experiment was, the experiment was done in the 50s by a gentleman with the name John Stapp. Uh, he was uh, living as you see, quite a long time. He was a medical doctor working for a Navy, American Navy. Uh, he was a pilot and uh, he was a doctor specializing in the aviation medicine. And when the uh, President Kennedy announced the lunar landing project, the one of the ex one of the important experiments in the pre pre preparation of a polar project was what is the highest acceleration which the pilots of the capsules will survive during a stand start of the rocket but more importantly during the re-entry into the earth atmosphere when the Apollo capsule comes back to the Earth, it has to hit, it, it essentially hits the Earth atmosphere and therefore it is decelerated extremely. Uh, and the question is how this will affect a human body. And Mr. Stapp is the owner of the world record in deceleration, which is essentially the same acceleration. And uh, this is a picture taken from the particular device in which he was accelerated and decelerated. And these were the rocket sledges. And um, if those of you who have seen a movie, Spielberg, one of the Spielberg movie about the uh, Indiana Jones, this was probably the last one uh, with this crystal skull. I forgot the name of it, this uh, title of this movie. Actually, it starts with the adventures of, a, of a Indiana Jones inside of the storage of, a, of uh, where the, 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 the Ark is stored and the Russian spies try to steal it. And uh, John uh, and, and Indiana Jones escapes this. Uh, uh, they are very un 
convenient for him situation with the Russian Tufts uh, riding in the rocket sledge. And that actually is the rocket sledge, which was, I mean, the initial picture when he sits in it is a, is a true picture of the rocket sledge, which was used in the 50s for the John Stapp experiment. There, were the, there was another pilot taking part in this experiment, and uh, uh, he suffered some kind of injuries in it. Uh, there are some stories that he even went further in the decelerating, but in any case, the stop record is a 38 G, 38 times the acceleration of, a gra uh, I mean of the Earth, uh, gravity which he survived in this uh, experiment without any injuries which were be either instantaneously or they will affect his life uh, in the forthcoming years. And as you see, he lived 89 years. He, at, when he quit the army, he was a professor of medicine at one of the American universities. He wrote also several books and was advisor to the many movies. So as you, as you see, you can survive a lot. This is a tremendous deceleration. The, as, as far as I know, the deceleration in the landing spaceship is uh, in the capsulas, I mean, not in the shuttles, but in the capsulas, was about, about 10 G. So that's okay. Um, we are actually uh, very susceptible to the acceleration. Uh, we grow up in the acceleration of Earth gravity, which is this approximately 10 meters per second square. And therefore, anything which is larger, we feel, and we occasionally behaves very unusual in this acceleration. Uh, the, well, you, this is one of the reasons why uh, accidents in the cars happen, because the good modern cars can decelerate very fast and uh, the drivers occasionally lose conscience for a blick of a second when the uh, deceleration exceeds 2G. So as you see, Mr. Stapp was tougher than most of usual uh, of most of us. All right, so that was the Bernoulli equation, but we were, be, we were so far talking about the ideal liquids. Ideal liquids are those which do not interact with the container walls in which they are contained. Uh, it will be like a river which flows through the riverbeds without interacting with the, with the sand and gravel with it. And that, of course, is a tremendously far-reaching uh, approximation. The liquids are essentially never such. And uh, most of the liquids and are liquids which we call viscose liquids. And the viscosity is uh, one of the properties of the liquid which uh, is responsible for the fact that um, if we push the liquid, we deposited in liquid a certain amount of energy, and that energy is being lost in the process of moving the liquid, and it is being lost by uh, internal friction of within the liquid. And let's look at this drawing. We have on the left a container, a situation where we have a, a box, a, a, a rectangular pipe, in which the liquid is moving. Uh, when the liquid is moving in it, we should learn how it behaves on the boundary of the liquid, when it, chattered, when it touches the surface. And of course, in reality, particles 
of the atoms or molecules or whatever is a constituent microscopic structure of the liquid, they do interact with the particles of the wall. So there is a force acting between the wall and the liquid and the in most of the cases this result in what the mathematicians and the physicists used to call a boundary conditions that is with the relation of a macroscopic velocity of the liquid at the solid wall and uh, for most of the liquids this macroscopic condition which with a, some pain uh, can be derived out of the microscopic pictures and there are physicists who developed a theory what happens and how this is being derived this macroscopic condition is that the velocity along the wall of the liquid on the wall is equal to zero. In other words, the liquid sticks to the wall. So if I have now the container, like on my drawing, and when I move the upper, upper wall of the container, then I also move a tiny layer of a liquid which is, which is attached to the wall. And in order to do so, I have to apply a certain force to my upper part of the container. Let's assume that the upper part of the container has area equal A, and the applied force is equal to F then the velocity of the liquid which is zero on the wall assumes a certain value when i move downwards in the liquid and let me call the infinitesimal a very small change of the velocity uh, as a capital delta v all right and um so the next layer of the liquid moves with a certain velocity. And let's now look at what happens further down in the liquid. The other layer of the liquid, which is adjacent to the la layer moving with the velocity delta V, will start moving again. But again, there is a force acting between these two layers. So the layer which was below the first one will be moving slightly with a slightly slower velocity and that is going on all the time and therefore i can make the drawing like i have done that the velocity is decreasing when i am moving downwards so if i denote the length of the container by x and the height by y then i can uh, observe that the velocity is decreasing with the height y when I am moving along the x direction. The other experiment which I can do is uh, slightly more easy to do because you can go to your kitchen and take uh, one of these devices with which you make, uh, I don't know what, if you are cooking anything, we are approaching the the Easter, so this is a time for cooking. We are baking the all sorts of things. We are making all the good and very unhealthy stuff to be eaten over the over this holiday period. And uh, if you have a container which is uh, a cylinder, and if you put this rotating shaft in the middle of the container, then when it starts to rotate then the liquid close to it is being now attached by the rotating shaft and it starts to move and well it is more complicated situation because it will be moved by the internal rotating shaft but then it will interact with the outer wall and the profile of a velocity field inside of such a, 
rotating container is much more complicated than on this uh, left drawing, and therefore I am I, I have not even care to write the formula for it, although it exists. So if I have now this situation, then I can uh, uh, observe by doing this experiment, then there is a relation between the force which I have to apply to move my upper layer of um, upper wall of a container, the area of the which I am moving, and the change of the velocity along the y direction. And the, the change of the velocity along the y direction is a, a change of velocity delta v divided by delta y. And this is time to the, it is time the area. And there is a sum coefficient uh, which depends on the kind of a liquid which is conventionally denoted by the letter eta, and it is called the viscosity coefficient. It is one of the material constants which is different from different liquids. And that, that is the relation. And if we will be studying a really mathematical formulation of a, a fluid dynamics, then this simple expression will allow us to write uh, one of the most difficult mathematical equations encountered in contemporary physics called Navier-Stokes equation. I, I have not written that equation because it's a partial differential equation which for some of you might have looked very ugly, but you have to believe me that this is one of the most beautiful and most interesting equations ever written by uh, physicists describing uh, behavior of material systems. This is non this is not linear. What happens? It's somebody has already fainted. Hello. What's going on? All right. Let's continue. The this um, this Navier Stokes equation is equation for which we do not know uh, exact solution for arbitrary situation. We 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 have been able to solve that equation for a very special cases. So as I said, this will this is a. Uh, ingredient which allow us to write this uh, complicated mathematical equation. And uh, let's now look up what is the dimension of that coefficients, uh, viscosity coefficient. And that is uh, the, out of the formula it comes, that it has a dimension of a force divided by area, divided by the change of the velocity along the y direction. Such an expression in mathematics is called gradient. So this is a gradient of a velocity along the y direction. Therefore, the force divided by area has a dimension of the force by, I mean, it's a, it's a mass times length divided by time square. Area is a length to the power second. And uh, the gradient of a velocity is the length over, is the one over time. So when we put this all together, a dimension of this coefficient is a kilograms per, per meter square, meter to the cube times second to the minus first. So this is a dimension of the, of the uh, uh, viscosity coefficient. In the description of a liquid, this is the very important coefficient. There is an equally important coefficient, and we probably will be not talking about, which is very similar and which describes the heat conduction of the, uh, how the heat is conducted in the liquid. And um, they are related 
with each other. All right. Uh, the unit, the unit of the of the of the of the viscosity coefficient is therefore a Pascal times second out of this formula, and Pascal times second, this unit is called Poise, P capital P. The Poise is uh, for uh, a name of a French physicist Poise, Poise to who had described a particular flow of a viscous liquid in a pipe, and we are slowly coming to this uh, uh, point in our lecture. This table shows you the, uh, what are the values of the, of the viscosity coefficient for different liquids, and uh, they depend, the, the viscosity coefficient depends on the temperature. So we have here the, the coefficients for the castor oil, water, air, and blood. And as you see, they, they, they change with the temperature. Uh, I, I was, for some reason, I didn't have the value of the blood viscosity coefficient at 40 centigrades. We are was in most of the cases already dead, and so is when our blood will be at zero degrees Celsius. So that's why these two points are missing. I also don't know why the, the books didn't give me the, the value of a castor oil friction coffee, uh, viscosity coefficient at 37 degrees for some reason. But as you see, this is a considerable change and uh, the viscosity coefficients are usually of the order of a 10 to the minus third. So they are usually called the mini, mini plus. Not the, the plus is a huge unit, so we will be using a smaller one. All right. So now we are going to discuss what is the consequences of the fact that the liquids are viscose on the, vis on the fluid flow. And the easiest cases when I have a cylindrical pipe through which the water is, uh, the liquid is flowing. Because it has a boundary condition that the, its macroscopic velocity on the solid wall is equal to zero, then the velocity profile will be such that the velocity on the both walls of the cylinder are equal to zero. Well, if we move towards the center of a cylinder uh, on my drawing, then the velocity will increase. But once we pass through the center of a cylinder, it must start to decrease because again, will have to be zero on the other wall. So we have a certain profile and that profile is completely symmetric. It's cylindrically symmetric. Therefore, the velocity must be uh, must be zero on the wall, and then it will be maximum at the center. And actually, that density, that velocity profile in the pipe will be uh, moving liquid will be uh, nothing uh, different than the parabola. The simple parabola. And that is the flow. So the average velocity in a pipe of a viscous fluid is, by a symmetry argument, a half of the maximum velocity in the middle. If that is the case, then we can calculate the quantity, which is a how much liquid flows through the pipe at the unit time. And it is conventionally denoted by letter Q. And obviously it is the area of the pipe times the average velocity. And therefore it is one half of the area times uh, maximum velocity. Okay. The, Good question at that stage will be, 
All right, that is the profile when the liquid is moving. And what happens if the liquid is stationary, but the walls are moving? And if the walls will be moving, and what is that the relation? And the relation is obviously the same, because if the walls will be moving to the right, then this parabolic profile of a liquid velocity will be facing left on my drawing and will be essentially identical to the picture I have drawn you now. And the relation between those two pictures are actually given by a, what in the physics is called the Galilean transformation because the liquid equations of motion describing also the viscous liquids are Galilean in value. Okay, so I therefore let's compare now what will happen if I have a pipe we use to describe the Bernoulli effect and this is on the left. If I have the pipe like this and there is ideal fluid which is going there then because of this narrowing, the velocity in the narrower part will be larger than the velocity in the left part of the pipe. But in the case of the viscous fluid, we have a completely different situation. The velocity will decrease with the pipe due to the just discussed consequences of the viscous. All right, so now we are coming to a, a, a point which will be a little bit tricky. As I said, the full mathematical equations describing flow of the viscous liquids are called the Navier-Stokes equations. And they are formidable mathematical equations. The analysis of this equation is continuously going on, but they have been proposed and derived in the 19th century. And the, for the mathematicians and physicists in the 19th century, solutions of these equations, which were necessary to analyze essentially everything from construction of the propellers in the ships to the analysis of uh, how the liquid is moving in the water channels, how to build the harbors and so forth and so forth, the, uh, and also how to discuss the flow in the very complex hydraulic system, which is the animal's body, and also in the enormously interesting hydraulic system which is the system in a trunk of a tree or in any other kind of vegetation which provides the flow of nutrition inside of the uh, flowers, trees. And the, the solutions were so difficult that people were not able to do it on a piece of paper analytically. And, uh, they have invented a method which is called the method of dimensional analysis. A trick how to guess certain solutions of this formidable equation. That technique is extremely powerful because it allows us to understand physically why the equations are solutions of the equations behaves the way they behave. But nowadays it is completely replaced by the computer simulation. Uh, the, if you watch in the evening the, water, uh, the weather forecast by the uh, broadcasters in the television or listen to the radio or whatever, these uh, results of the weather predictions are actually a results of a particular solutions of a Navier-Stokes equation which is supplemented with the tremendously more complicated equation describing a heat conduction and the, and actually modified because it's 
the air is the, the, the atmosphere is not a homogeneous liquid. It has many different components. It has uh, it has water in it, and it has air, and it has it has all sorts of dirt. The, the we are now so much always interested in what is happening with the all sorts of uh, dirt pollutions which are inside of the air, which we are then which we call conventionally as uh, smog, which is not really a correct name, but anyway, and um, so. The, there is a branch of physics, which in mathematical physics, which is dealing with the computer solutions of energy stocks equations. But that is not what we are going to use. So we will use a dimensional analysis, part of this guessing of the results to derive a certain interesting formula. All right. We have a pipe. And we have a pipe which, like in a Bernoulli effect, had a certain pressure on both ends, and it has a length, L, and it flows through the pipe with the average velocity, V, bar. All right. Then the, uh, then the pressure difference, which is a difference of the pressure at the ends of the pipe, is uh, uh, actually uh, proportional to the product of a velocity times L. But we don't know how it is proportional. And I will try to calculate this now. I could either solve this problem using the Navier-Stokes equation, but I can also guess the solution using dimensional analysis. Out of this equation, it follows that the average velocity inside of the pipe should be somehow proportional to the delta p divided by the length. But what, is, what are the other coefficients in this expression? All right. This, there are, there are two other coefficients, two other important variables which have not been used so far. One of these variables is the radius of the pipe. Why the radius? Because we know that the velocity must be zero on the walls. Therefore, this paraboloid profile must depend on the radius. And the other is, of course, the viscosity coefficient. But what we do not know is whether this average velocity should be proportional to the radius, to the radius squared, to the radius of the power five. Well, we don't know that power. Similarly, we don't know the relation with the viscosity coefficient. So let's guess that the velocity inside will be proportional to the delta p over L, which, we, which is obvious, and then the radius of the pipe to the power A, and the viscosity coefficient to the power b. And we have no knowledge of a and b. And it turns out that we can guess exactly what, what that can be. Excuse me, I, I, I have a phone and I, I have to switch it off. I'm terribly sorry, I should have, I've forgotten to switch it off. All right. All right, so let's, let's look at this expression which we have on the top. On the left side of the equation, we have the average value of velocity. Uh, what is the dimension of the velocity? It's the distance divided by time. So the square brackets denotes the dimension of the variable. L stands for the length, and capital T stands for the time. So the dimension of the average velocity is just the length over time. The dimension of a radius is, of course, the length. Dimension of a pressure, remember, pressure is a force over area, it's the mass times L to the minus first, 
and time to the minus second. And from our previous slide today, the dimension of the viscosity coefficient is a mass times L to the minus first, times time to the minus first. So now we have to put it all together and we write the, that equation in dimension form. The L, the velocity, this is, we, we don't know the beta, but the beta is a number, is a, just a coefficient, proportionality coefficient, so we, we don't know it. This is delta P over L, that's the dimension. Then comes the radius to the power A, so it's a length to the power A, and comes the viscosity coefficient to the power B, so that's this term. All right. And now you see how that proceeds. On the left-hand side, I just have to get A divided by time. So let's first concentrate on time. Here is a time to the power minus second. Here is a time to the power minus one. But there is a coefficient B. So if I put B equal to minus one, that T to the minus one will become a time. So this will cancel with the minus two. And if I make a B equal minus one, then oh, I have already fixed that time, time, time dependence. All right. So I already have, then if this is T to the minus one, then I can kind of observe that B is minus one. So that M will get coefficient M to the power minus one. So it will cancel with this M. And all over the sudden, the velocity, average velocity in the pipe will no longer be dependent on the density. It will not depend on the mass per unit volume. That means the density. Great. Uh, this coefficient will be the L to the power. That is L to the minus second. This is L to the first. So this all coefficient will turn out to be just one over length times time. And this is times to the L to the power A. Okay, so then I have to put A equal two, and then this will be correct. This will be the proper expression. So A is equal to two, B is equal to minus one, and I guess by dimension analysis, that the average velocity is uh, some um, coefficient of proportionality, delta P over L times R squared over E. And that is the exact expression which I have derived without doing any mathematics. Well, I didn't guess beta, and in order to know what is actually numerical value of that coefficient beta, there is no other way by either do the experiments or to do the detailed calculations. It turns out that the detailed calculations give the coefficients beta equal to one a. And that is the Poiset law. The Poiset law which says that the average velocity of a viscose flow through the pipe with the radius r and with the length l is given by that formula. As you see, it's inversely proportional to the viscosity coefficient. So the larger the viscosity coefficient, the, uh, the, uh, the smaller is the velocity. And uh, the area is PR2 square. So that is also, then I can, the area of a pipe, the cross section of a pipe is a pi times r square. And we remember this, the quantity Q, the average rate of a flow of a velocity through this whole pipe. This is the area times mean velocity. And then the flow is proportional to the fourth power of the radius and inversely proportional to the viscosity coefficient. 
All right. So that is the very important flow. And in what will follow, we will use it to solve some applica I mean, in some applications. All right. Consider an example, which is uh, actually a, a flow of a blood in uh, uh, in the huge in the main artery of a of a animal blood, and the radius of that artery is about ten to the minus third meter. And we consider a flow of a blood through this artery, which is a one cubic centimeter per second. Then the velocity, mean velocity, is the mean flow over area. So it's, a, it's, it's essentially two times 10 to the minus second meters per second. And therefore, the maximum velocity is twice that number. And since in my table, which I have shown you, I can read the viscosity, and basically there is no difference between the viscosity of, a, of an animal like a dog and the humans. This is uh, 2 times 10 to the minus third plus. So I can calculate the pressure difference from the, from the Coise law. And the pressure difference in the artery of a dog is about two pascals. And why I do calculate that? Because having the, 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 the pressure, I can calculate the force, uh, which is the pressure times the cross section of the artery. And if I multiply that by the mean velocity, I calculate the quantity, which is a power, how much power we should apply in order to push that amount of blood to the artery of that animal. And that turns out to be, after a calculation, after I put this number in, it turns out to be 10 to the minus 6 of a watt. Watt is the power unit. We know it because we are, I mean, all the electric equipment which we have are labeled with the, what is the power consumption. All right, so this is 10 to the minus 6. Because the average power of the, of the animal heart is about 10 watts, then this pushing the blood through the main artery is, is a peanuts for animal as for us. What it becomes difficult is pushing the blood through the very small blood vessels in our fingertips or in our brain or in other tissues out of which our body is built. So we will be discussing it slightly later. Okay, now the important variable in description that flow is what the engineers call resistivity of the flow. And again, if I have a pipe, the pipe which has a radius r, there's a velocity flowing. The rate of flow is q. Difference of a pressure is delta p, and the length is l. Then I can calculate the quantity, which is resistivity of the flow, r sub f, which is a ratio of delta p over a rate of flow. And if we, the unit of it, is a pascals by second divided by meter cube. And if we use the Poiseuille law, and we can easily calculate that the rate, the resistivity is just that quantity. So the rate of flow is proportional to the fourth, radio, fourth power of the radius, but the but the uh, resistivity is inversely proportional to the R of the fourth. So let's calculate how it is. This with the radius of an artery in the human body is about 10 to the minus third, is, is slightly small, smaller. Then I can, using the values from my table, calculate the resistivity. 
and out of that I can calculate the average the pressure difference in our arteries and that is 3.7 pascals it's slightly larger than for the dog all right and uh, now we are coming to the most fascinating problem in contemporary physics uh, you are of course aware of that fact that we have a fantastic that the physics is a very complicated science dealing with the elementary constituents of our matter we are giving with the gravitation forces which holds the universe together or allow it to expand that we now studying uh, our colleagues doing astrophysics are involved in analysis how the um, universe came to existence and so forth and so forth but there is a one of the uh, unsolved problems of so-called classical physics and it has a name of a turbulent flow and you have been aware to the word turbulence for if you fly on a plane then it is always that the captain comes on the intercom and says that there will be a turbo that we will that we are approaching a turbulence area okay we will then this the understanding mathematical understanding of a phenomenon which is called turbulence is uh, is still open there are many attempts to solve it and there are many important results but a full understanding of that particular phenomenon is still missed all right so we are talking about the turbulent flow and the turbulent flow is um, is related to a a cabalistic number a hydrodynamics of a viscous liquid and this from the from this time of the 19th century where people were trying to understand its property is full of different numbers with the different names and probably the most important number is in which is called Reynolds number it is of course related to the name of a great British physicist and mathematician Mr. Reynolds and if I have a pipe with the radius r that dimensionless number which is called r sub e is uh, given by the following formula and in some cases people are using the diameter instead of a radius so i have written both of these formulas here d is just two r is a diameter this is a dimensional number and actually it comes from a formal definition uh, if I apply a force to push the liquids, then I have two forces. The inertia force, which is related how much force I have to apply to accelerate a unit mass of the vis vis viscose fluid. And the other force is a viscose force, which tries to hold it. And the ratio of these two forces is obviously dimensionless number. And again, by using my dimensionless analysis, I can calculate that this formally defined quantity is given by the formula. Inertia force is just mass times length divided by time square, the mass per unit volume. The viscous force is the viscosity times, remember, the, the the area times the gradient of the velocity and if i put it there then this is the simple calculation similar to that what we have done and this give us this expression so this is the reynolds number and now why it is is important consider our beloved pipe which is the top drawing on this leg. We have the velocity flow, which has this beautiful parabolic shape. So the layers of the liquids, streams of the liquids are moving parallel to each other, and they are all the same through all the pipe. 
This is what the mathematician and the physicist called laminar flow. The liquid streams form a lamina, a straight sort of lines extending through whole pipe. But experimentally, we observed that when the velocity increases, or the density changes, or the, vel or the viscosity changes, then the flow changes. And all over the sudden, this laminar flow is no longer there. The, the streams of liquid starts to curve, change, go back, and becomes very rough. This non-parallel non streams, which have the shapes drawn here in, the, in that way, we were called eddies, a local vorticity. The liquid, when it starts to rotate, has a vor this, when the ve local velocity of a liquid is no, not only translation, but also rotation, then this is called eddies. Similar phenomenon happened when I have, yeah, all right, I have shown it again. So if I have a pipe which changes its diameter, then in the thick pipe, the flow is continuously laminar. But when it gets lower, the ideal flow will continue to go and the Bernoulli equation will be applicable. But for a viscous fluid, the velocity will change and it will in most of the cases becomes full of eddies and that phenomenon when the eddies are being formed is called turbulence and the same phenomena happens for example if i have a stream of liquid hitting an obstacle for example a sphere or a balloon or the wing of the airplane or us on the water skis or whatever and if we move very slowly then the flow will be around us and it will then become laminar at a certain length behind us but for liquid vis for fluid when the not the velocity but the reynolds number exceed a certain value flow up behind it will develop such eddies. You must have seen it by, for example, going in a boat. Then if you look at the back on the kill water, you will see that there are these eddies on the surface of the water which are formed behind the moving obstacle. All right. And the, every flow of the viscous liquid is characterized by the average velocity, a typical length, and the viscosity coefficient. Why there is only typical length? Because you remember that in the expression for a Reynolds number, there was a di di diameter of a pipe divided by the length. Diameter but uh, the area is this, the area divided by length. The area is the square, and the I'm sorry, there's no the area is measured in the length square, and the length in the length. Therefore, this is a proportion to the length. And uh, all that is combined in dimensional as number Reynolds number, and it turns out that the occurrence of the eddies and the turbulent behavior happens when the Reynolds number for a liquid exceeds a certain critical value. And it is probably very difficult to see here, but it shows a, a particular experiment. We have a pipe with a flowing liquid, and through a little, uh, little additional ventil, which is on the top of it, we inject into the liquid a dye. 
And when the flow is laminar, then the dye in the liquid will form a straight line and you will see a beautiful colored line extended in the flow. The liquid which carried the dye in an unperturbed laminar way. But when we change the Reynolds number, for example, by, ex by accelerating the liquids, then all of a sudden we will see that the stream of a dye will start to oscillate. And eventually, when we further exceed the velocity, then it becomes completely chaotic. It starts to move in a very strange way. The eddies will be formed. And that happens when the Reynolds number exceeds a certain uh, number. For a particular system here, it is Reynolds number is a 4,000. So that is why the Reynolds number is very important. And here we, I have shown you the same thing for the pleasure of, for example, in our blood vessels. In our blood vessels, the, the most of the fluid of blood flow is laminar. But it might happen that it become that the narrow that the pressure is increasing, or there is a narrowing of a pipe of, of the of the vessel. For example, when we have a sclerotic situation, and then the flow of the blood in the vein or artery might become also turbulent. And uh, I have drawn here a picture, which is a. Uh, uh, a change of a character of a flow uh, with respect to the pressure difference. And when this is as relatively small, then the laminar flow will happen. And when the Reynolds number exceeds the number for a human blood, which is 2,200, then it changes and it becomes a turbulent flow. And what is the, the most typical application of it? This is what you must have known. It's apparatus for measuring our blood pressure. And uh, you know how it works. You put some, some uh, what, what's the name of it? A rubber cuff on your hand and you pump it and then you release the pressure and you listen to what is happening. In old times, it was such that the doctor had a step by the pump in his hand and stethoscope in his, on his head and was listening to what is happening inside. From what, what, what noise comes out from your blood artery in your hand. Nowadays, this is done automatically. You buy the machine for well, 100 slotties and that machine pumps automatically the cuff and uh, the and does everything and and writes the the results on the liquid crystal display so what is actually happening when you put that cuff and increase the pressure then you close the the, the artery eventually the pressure is such that the artery in your arm is closed and the blood stop flowing so the doctor or this device recognized that there is no noise coming out and it measures what the force it applies, how much air it pumped in and that is calibrated in the pressure units. So it knows what is the pressure when it closes the vein. Then it opens up slowly. It opens up slowly and when there is a very tiny little narrowing open, then due to the fact that there is a huge pressure difference in the artery above the cuff and below, the flow of a blood becomes turbulent. So there is a characteristic sound emitted by the eddies which are formed in the blood, and this either machine or a doctor recognize that the that the that the that the that the that this 
the, the blocking of the artery has been removed. So it's, it's another number of a pressure here the machine is recording. And then the pressure is released farther and farther. And when the difference in the pressure becomes much lower, then the Reynolds number decreases and the flows become laminar again. So the voice, the noise, I'm sorry, changes into the same it was at the beginning. And the doctor or the machine recognizes it, and that's the lower value of the pressure. And with this uh, simple machine, with this, uh, with this temporary transition of a blood flow from a laminar to the turbulent, the machine measures our pressure. All right. So what we can do further with a turbulent flow? Well, that is a turbulent flow, which is I just mentioned, left by the by the by the plane by by the boat behind the behind it. And here is a, a is a beautiful experiment uh, to show a turbulent occurrence of a turbulence. Namely, we have a laminar flow, and it all of a sudden turns into this beautiful eddies, and this is a magnification of those eddies. Uh, I have admit I have lost in my notes somewhere in my office a picture which is a copy of a drawing made uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was uh, uh, almost the first individual who was studying a turbulence, and there is a beautiful drawing in one of his um, archives of uh, how he draws a transition from the uh, from a laminar to the turbulent flow, and uh, that picture here is uh, is a real experimental proof that the imagination of the of the uh, Leonardo da Vinci was incredible that he had predicted. If I will find it, I will, and for next time I show you this. All right. So that is the, that's the turbulence, and that is a modern time turbulence. What you see here is uh, actually a, 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 a solution of the uh, as a computer simulation of the turbulence. There is a solution which is a numerical solution of the Navier-Stokes equation for a viscous liquid, which shows the transition from a laminar flow on the left side of the picture into the turbulent flow on the right. And if you look at this picture, you see something quite interesting, namely, you see or maybe we can even see it better on the previous picture over here. You see, there was a laminar flow, and the laminar flow all of a sudden goes over into a, it's formed the eddy. And that's a huge eddy. Dimension of that eddy is similar to the typical dimension of a laminar flow. And then you have even bigger toe, and then when the turbulence develops, there are no big eddies, there are small eddies. There is a, this white water is consisting of a smaller and smaller eddies. You see it here, you have a huge eddies which decay into smaller and smaller eddies. And that you can see also here. You have a laminar flow and all of a sudden something is becoming to develop the eddies and the, they, 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 they come into a smaller eddy. And the, the understanding of a turbulent flow lies in the what happens to the eddies in the liquid. And uh, here is a transition. There is a laminar flow, and there are these turbulent eddies. And um, I make the following picture. We have uh, dimensions of those eddies. There are large eddies and the small eddies. And here is the uh, eddy orbital velocity. 
that is how, how fast it rot the liquid is rotating, basically. And as you see, this, in, this velocity increases with the dimension of the, of the eddy. And it is experimentally verified that the energy flow, what happens to the energy which was pushed into the liquid, what causes the turbulence is that it sort of goes like this arrow shows. It goes from the, air of, from the large eddies into a smaller eddy. And that was an observation, experimental observation. And for years and years and years, people were trying to describe that phenomenon. And eventually, they, this flow of energy into the, from a large eddies to the small eddies, which is called energy cascade, has been described by remarkably simple formula, which is the energy of an eddy with the size lambda, which mathematically is easier to write as a one over lambda for reasons which I will not discuss, is proportional to the to the length to the power five third, or to the inverse power to the power minus five third. And that is the relation which holds experimentally, although it has never been derived fully mathematically from the theory of the equations. This is a drawing for this. And that, uh, that in equation, which in some sense is a phenomenological equation, was derived by, <laughs> what is it? What is in some sense pretty funny, by one of the biggest mathematicians of the 20th century, Andrei Kolmogorov. Here you see the Andrei Kolmogorov teaching in a high school. Because Kolmogorov, who was a mathematician who is a father of contemporary probabilist theory of probability, and also uh, old, uh, creator of the most fundamental theorems in the, in the nonlinear physics called CAM, Kolmogorov Arnold Moser theorem about the nonlinear mechanical systems. Uh, uh, Kolmogorov was extremely busy with teaching children. Uh, uh, in the late 70s, he set up in the Soviet Union at the time a chain of schools for a particularly gifted children, and he was uh, 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 running this system and he was teaching in one of those schools in, the, in Moscow. And then you see the, he's talking about the elementary mathematics of the triangles. He was remarkable, uh, really truly remarkable uh, mathematician. And that formula, the only, and one of the most fundamental theorems of a tur uh, facts in the theory of turbulence, we, uh, was proposed by Kolmogorov, on the basis of purely intuitive arguments. And it turns out that this, this is uh, correct. Essentially, every important mathematics physicist of the 20th century was trying to contribute to the theory of turbulence. Werner Heisenberg was writing of a turbulence, Max von Laue, uh, and well, they, they had some ideas, but there is no real, really very good theory. Probably the, the major contribution of, a, of the, to the uh, theory of turbulence was given by an uh, extremely rich individual, Mr. Kretschmann, who had never been actually employed as a scientist and he was always working on the turbulence, had written fundamental papers on it, and was advisor to the many research institutions. But he was, as it is said in English, independently wealthy, so he never actually was working at any university. And his papers were always 
signed by his private home address. All right. Uh, and now I would like to make a short departure from the physics of fluid, because we have been just seeing the energy cascades and the fact how the laminar flows goes over a turbulent flow, which looks like a complete chaos. And uh, in the, and I think that for you as a biologist and medicine people, it is of some interest what I will now tell you. And, which, and this is, uh, for, in some sense, what we have been discussed so far is related to the fundamental problem in contemporary civilization, which has been born in 1798 by a paper, and an essay, entitled An Essay on the Principle of Population, which was written by a, a certain gentleman with the name Thomas Malthus. Malthus was a biologist, he was a clergyman, biologist and um, experimentator, and also part politician. And he was warning that the, uh, in, the, in the 18th century, that the earth is coming to its end because the growing human population will overuse the capacity of the earth to sustain the, uh, our consumption of water materials about the production of the, of the food and so forth and so forth. Uh, he had good reasons to worry about it because at that time the earth was approaching the crisis, which has never been called a climate crisis, but it was a food crisis because the agriculture in the 18th century and in the, in the also in 19th century later on, was approaching uh, an edge of a collapse due to the lack of the, of the, of the nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, the, uh, the, the farmers were using uh, artificial methods of uh, adding the nitrogen to the, to the earth by using three fields and two fields uh, that they have a one field which were they using and the other on which they were growing very few uh, uh, vegetations which were able to uh, absorb the, uh, the nitrogen from the, from the earth and then those decaying, this decaying vegetation was a source of nitrogen in the air. And uh, the, at the turn of the 18th and 19th century, people have discovered that there are ample supplies, they thought, natural supplies of the uh, nitrogen-rich fertilizers in Chile. These were the enormous amounts of the uh, birds' wastes uh, left there the Chilean guano, and there were fleets of special kind of ships, black ships so-called, which were carrying uh, thousands of thousands of tons of the Chilean guano to the Europe and the, the United States and any other countries, because that guano was used as a fertilizer and uh, allowed the increase of the productivity of uh, agriculture to feed the growing population. But Malthus was warning that that had been, that this amount of uh, uh, these fertilizers in Chile is, is finite. So it will be exhaust, uh, it will, that we will run out of it at a certain stage. And uh, what will happen then with, with our, uh, our uh, civilization? So he was warning how the population grows and develops. And uh, uh, later on, it was picked up by other people. And one of them was Adelf Kelet, Kekelet, a Belgium mathematician, astronomer, and also 
director of the of the Royal Astronomy Observatory in Brussels, and uh, uh, he had been he had forwarded this interest in the growth of the population to another Belgium scientist, Peter Pierre Verhulst. Pierre Verhulst was completely forgotten until the 20th century. He was, uh, he lived very short. He died on tuberculosis. He was a very interesting individual because after he got his degree in mathematics, he went to work in Italy and he was, uh, that was a very revolutionary period of Italy when he was there. And um, the Italian that he was involved in the politics of Italy very much, he returned to Brussels and becomes a professor of mathematics at freshly and uh, freshly uh, open up uh, Freie University, a free university of Brussels, which still exists. And um, he had written a fundamental paper uh, to the population of the. Uh, principle of population and um, uh, uh, Demaitus had predicted in his essay and that was the idea until the first that the population grows and it grows exponentially and uh, this is basically what the experts which are telling us about the coronavirus epidemic nowadays are always plotting this all curves saying that they are surely there is this exponential explosion and they worry about that result. So in some sense, it's a, exactly the same worry as the war of Mr. Malthus for other reasons. And Mr. Fairhurst had solved the problem. I'm sorry, there is something what happened wrong. Uh, Let me change the, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, we are now on the road, uh, we start uh, a few slides, which I call the road to cows. And in Fairhurst in the 38 had, written a, a very simple equation. On the left hand side of that equation, we have the change of a population in time. How fast the population changes in time. This in mathematics is described as a first time derivative. And the population number of the individuals is denoted here by letter X and it changes in time. And that equation is extremely simple is a quadratic equation and it is a pro right hand side is a product of a population and the other term is the how the population is decreasing the units are chosen such that the highest population is denoted by one and that's the differential equation for a very small x, when this number x of time is small, solution of that equation, uh, this is a solution of the whole equation, the, equ the equation is exponential curve, and this is this blue curve on my drawing. But for a, for a large times, the formula becomes different, it's a complete analytic formula, and that is a Verhulst curve, this red curve. The population is initially increasing exponentially. This exponent is slowing and slowing. This is exactly what is now being shown on this exponential growth curve from the coronavirus. And eventually, there is a turnover and it becomes equal to whatever is the 
the number because we can choose the initials that depends on the initial solution on the initial value the x is zero so that was the Verhulst equation and it shows that the, that mr maltus was basically wrong because we have the the dynamics of a population is not actually a exponential growth as you know the basic idea that we will run out of the fertilizers turn out to be wrong because uh, it was re again brought up to the public opinion at the end of the 19th century by another british scientist mr crooks and uh, uh, he had predicted that the earth will run out of the fertilizers in the 1920 or something and uh, of course that didn't happen because in the meantime humans invented the way of producing fertilizers nitrogen fertilizers by being able to produce ammonia uh, and ammonia was produced very cheaply by uh, ammonia uh, nitrogen which exists in the air uh, by uh, electric based processes and there were two processes, one by Mr. Bosch and Haber, and the other by less effective by the gentleman who later on becomes a president of Poland, Ignacy Mościcki. Uh, he was much better chemist than he was a president, uh, and uh, which is an advice to scientists that they should think twice before becoming politicians. And um, and uh, and we we had enough uh, fertilizers now at least all right so this is the Hulst curve and then comes a 20th century and at the end of the 19th and 20th century the population dynamics was brought up by the crooks but it was essentially analyzed by the two gentlemen on the left side of the picture one was alfred lotka alfred lotka is a mathematician who was born in Lwów in Poland at that time and later on went with his parents to the United States. He has been a statistician. He was very interested in the uh, uh, applying his knowledge of mathematics and statistics in applied statistics sciences. And for most of his life, he was working as a chief statistician for MetLife. MetLife is a huge American insurance company, metropolitan insurance company, a life company, and I believe it also operational now in Poland. And uh, the other person is one of the most important mathematicians of the early 19th century, Vito Volterra. Vito Volterra was an Italian mathematician. He had contributed to the mathematics enormously. And he also was a, extremely important in physics. He is an author of the many concepts in the, in the theory of elasticity and in, the, in, in general. And uh, he is also important individual because when Mussolini and the fascist government was formed in Italy, the university professors and actually all the state employee were obliged to uh, uh, to sign the, a, a kind of loyalty decree for Mussolini and Vito Volterra together with only I believe 13 other scientists had declined it so he was fired from the university he was stripped of all his titles he was a president of one of the Italian Academy of Sciences and he emigrated and he was living in outside of Italy. And then he was very badly ill. And eventually he, he, in 1940, he, he was allowed to return to Rome where he died. His sons were also scientists. One of them were working for NASA. And, uh, and uh, eventually in the already our times, uh, distinguished Australian mathematician, physicist, and biologist Robert May, here it's on this picture, 
who is still alive, had been very much interested in the population dynamics. And this is the step of the following. The first were Lotka and Volterra. And Lotka and Volterra, basically Volterra, Volterra had a daughter. And his daughter was uh, uh, eventually married uh, biologist uh, um, Umberto d'Ancona and Ancona was um, was uh, busy with the population of fish in Adriatic Sea and apparently was so bothering Volterra with the stories about how those we, uh, those fishes are extinct and grow, uh, how these populations interact and so forth that eventually Volterra had written the equation which you have here. And this is an equation which you as a biologist should know. It has a name, its name is called prey predator equation. The X is the number of prey and Y is the number of predators. And this is an equation. And that equation has a solution, oscillatory solution. And it fits a beautifully a data of a Hudson Bay company, which was for years and years treading, treading in the furs of animals hunted in northern Canada, for example, uh, 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 rabbits and the and the lynx, and this uh, the number the X are rabbits and Y are lynx, and you see a beautiful. This this is a solution of this equation, which fits the actually the data. And that was, a, so the Lotka and Volterra described that. But then uh, Robert May and uh, Michael van den Feigenbaum, Stefan Tome, and Siegfried Grossman have observed that the Verhulst equation is a peculiar equation when you forget about the mathematics. And instead of writing a differential equation, if you write a uh, what is called the, you, you discretize it. And you say that the population at the state number n plus one, next generation, is related to the current generation by the, by the following expression. The population changes from zero to one, and the coefficient r might change from zero to four. And that is a discretized version of a Verhulst equation. And that is what is called logistic map. And it has a remarkable property. If you start running it on a computer for a particular value of R, then if you R is very small, then you get a different picture when R is exceeding a certain value, which is 3.8 something. Then the, this map becomes completely chaotic. And that what you see on this drawing is is actually the solution of the Verhulst discrete map, a population plotted as the number of R. And this is the result of uh, several hundreds of iteration of this equation. For each value of R, we run a computer calculating the, this map for say thousands of times. And when R is a very small number, then it is just one number. It will come out to one number and it will crank and it will provide the same number. And that is a trajectory for that one solution of that map when R is increasing. And all over the sudden, at the certain value of R, the map bifurcates. There are two solutions coming out from our map. The computer will generate two numbers, two numbers, two numbers for a huge region. And then bingo, at another critical value, all over the sudden, it will bifurcate. Each of these branches will bifurcate again. And then again, 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 and you will become a complete mess. But this mess 
looks like the cascade. We have this something become chaotic, but it has this window. And if you look at this window by a magnifying glass, and you actually can see it on my drawing, that in here, in here, this is exactly the same picture. One, two branches, and so forth. One branch, two branches, and cows. And if the same happens for various values here. And that is the famous chaotic picture. And with this observation of uh, Michael Feigenbaum and Robert May, a science of chaos comes. And then people have discovered that the word chaos, which were associated with the chaotic behavior of a turbulent flow, is not exactly the same chaos as it happens in other nonlinear objects. And we have a pretty good understanding of that science of chaos, which is related to the population dynamics. And that, that's why I decided to break a flow story for a while to tell you this in order to show you that what looks that the word of house is is very very broad and we have a chaos of a turbulence and a chaos of a chaotic maps and they look quite similar that it's something is chaotic but the physics of it and mathematics are essentially different so thank you very much we will see us next week, and I hope that this Zoom will not generate another funny numbers, this ID numbers and compute the, the password uh, for other our meeting. If it happened, then I will send. All right.